Hello guys, uh, Fru here. Welcome to uh, the channel. Welcome to today's uh, lecture. So today we're going to be talking about data fabric versus uh, data mesh. Uh, this is something that has grown by leaps and bounds in the industry and everyone is talking about it. Uh, you might hear of data fabrics. There are vendors talking about it, trying to sell products. There are uh, service delivery companies talking about it, trying to impl uh, implement these uh, companies. And the, the net result is the average architect, the average decision maker is left confused, right? Is this just another buzzword, another jargon uh, from consultants trying to uh, get you to uh, buy services from them or buy products from them? So what I'm going to do here is, as always, uh, take this concept, uh, really unpack it and break it down and go into the fundamentals uh, for the layperson to understand what is a data fabric and what is a data mesh. And as we go through, we're going to answer a couple of questions. Uh, we're going to be looking at the differences. We're going to look at why they exist in the first place. Uh, can one can ex uh, can one exist without the other? Can you have a data mesh without a data fabric? Uh, what are the pros and cons if you have to go to one of these two architecture or design, or design patterns? Um, and then at the very end, Hopefully, when you leave this, watching this to the end, you will get a better appreciation uh, for these two concepts that have uh, become very uh, popular and very common in the data ecosystem today. Now, this is near and dear to my heart. This is uh, as an architect, as a practitioner in this space, uh, having done this for decades, um, I, I can tell you that you know a, a smart person once said um, that uh, history doesn't repeat itself it only rhymes and you just have to listen and, and pay attention to the rhythm of history and the reason why i bring that up is that as we go through this you might uh people who've been in this space might realize that these are concepts that might have existed before in just different terms different names or the, the same battles being fought in different ways and at the end of the day this is what these two things come down to so i'm reminded by uh, the big data warehousing a battle between Bill Inam and uh, Ralph Kimball, and people were thinking, you know, with Bill, uh, where you had a centralized data warehouse, and then you had uh, 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 denormalized uh, mats coming from the warehouse. Whereas Kimball was talking about having your your this, your mats uh, before you bring everything into a centralized warehouse. And there's always that debate of where do we put control uh, and where do we put consistency. And so this is something that has been around uh, for a while, again in different spaces, in different scopes. So. That said, let's dive in into uh, into looking at at this uh, and and unpacking this from a more fundamental level. So, if we look at data fabric and we look at data mesh, forget data. Let's just focus on the two: of fabric and the mesh. So, let's think about it. And I did a Google or I did a Google search right before uh, as I was preparing for this lecture. Uh, in the research was. What would be a fabric? If you think about a fabric, a fabric might be something like this. If you think about the piece of cloth you're wearing and it's made up of a fabric that was sold for that cloth. So you might, if you look very closely at the, 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 the material that makes up your clothes, you might see something like a fabric. We all know that um, from just basically looking at, at your clothes. But here's what's interesting. If we go in and we look or do a search for a mesh, what you realize is that, and I was surprised by this, or maybe not too surprised, is a mesh is not that too different from a fabric. So you might come up with something like this, that uh, is a mesh. Now, looking at this, it doesn't really help us. We have a fabric uh, and we have a mesh, and fundamentally they're the same thing. But we we'll expect that data fabric and data mesh to be different. So this approach of looking at it wasn't very helpful to differentiate between fabric and mesh and extrapolating that to data fabric versus data mesh. So let's take a different approach. Let's go back and we take an analogy from, from physics. So we go into physics and we take an analogy from physics. I love, I love physics. I love physics documentaries. Um, there are really some amazing documentaries you can watch in, in physics and they're talking about, uh, one of them talks about that I've watched the fabric. You might hear of a documentary that talks about the fabric of the universe. 
or the fabric of space is another thing that physics talks a lot about. What is the fabric of the universe? What is the fabric of space? So this this concept of of fabric is one that a lot of people, a lot of disciplines are asking about it, are asking about it, and there's a lot of discourse. So when we come into the data space, it's, it only it, it's, uh, behooves us to not just take it for what it is, but to go down to that first principle, to the fundamental level, to understand these concepts, because then we can build back up from it. So what does physics think about the, the fabric of the universe or the fabric of, of space? Now, I'm not a physicist, and, and I don't claim to know a lot in this domain, but I'm just going to borrow a couple of characteristics. Let's uh, bring this here, that the physicists or the people who work in that space in physics, uh, fundamental physics or astrophysics or quantum physics, they all talk about this, would be if we look at the characteristics, or we can maybe write that out in full, so we're not writing that in short. If we take the look at the characteristics, characteristics of the fabric, of the universe when we're talking about fabric there are a couple of things that are relevant if you think about describing something as the fabric of the universe at that point you really would want to go down to the most the most fundamental description right so description or framework or building block. There are lots of things that comes in there. The most fundamental description of something. So when we talk about the fabric of the universe and from physics, and we're borrowing that concept to bring it back to data fabric, we're looking at something that fundamentally describes. And it's changed over time. This concept of the fabric has changed from physics. You know, uh, when I was in, in, in school, early on as a youngster, well, I learned that the fabric of the universe was the... Uh, was the atom was the smallest thing in the universe and then you go on to more advanced physics and you start hearing about quarks and gluons and, and more advanced stuff and so physics still isn't settled on that right there is a standard model of physics and there's there's a whole lot of debate happening in that space of what is the most fundamental description of the universe so the fabric of the universe still hasn't been uh i don't think it has been settled but the, the thing we want to get from there is the most fundamental fundamental is what we want to get the next piece of it is the essence, right? We can call it fundamental or we can call it the essence of the universe, the essence. What is this, this universe around us made of? What is that essence of it? Is it matter? Is it, is it emptiness? What is it? So when we describe something as a fabric, we're talking about the essence of that thing. Now, one other characteristic, and this is the key characteristic, there could be more, but I brought just three of them, which would be uh, if something is the fabric or the essence of the universe or the essence of space, it has to be globally, it has to be globally consistent. It has to be globally consistent. Otherwise, it's not the essence. So if you have a characteristic that describes space and it's true here in my uh, hometown and you go a thousand miles away and it's not true, then it's not the essence. Something, something else has to be the essence. If it's true here on planet Earth and you go to Mars and it's not true, then it's not the essence. So this idea of globally consistent or global consistency is really key when we talk about fabric when we talk about fabric all right so now let's bring this back to what we care about in the discussion let's bring this back to the wall of data let's bring this back to the wall of data how can we borrow some of these concepts of essence globally consistent fundamental and bring it into data so we're going to use this to 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 describe uh, uh what the data fabric is now, before we describe the data fabric, let's talk about things that are usually uh, relevant uh, when people work with data. And I'm going to put this in green because we can, we're can we going to reference this. All right. Things needed when working with data. Data teams, what do they need? They need data access. They need data uh, access to data. So let's say data access. 
they need uh, they might need the way to discover that data. So data discovery. They might need transformations, way to transform that data. They might need integration options, way to integrate that data across different systems. They might also need governance and lineage and security, orchestration. There is a lot of things uh, that are needed by data teams to effectively work with data. And this is just a, a tip of the iceberg orchestration. All right. So now we understand the things that data teams need. How does this tie into helping us appreciate or build uh, a framework to understand what the data fabric is? So what is a data fabric? If we were to build from what we saw above from physics and we come back to describe a data fabric, a data fabric in this case now would be uh, a singular uh, approach of working with data that is globally consistent. Again, we're, we're taking this idea of globally consistent that describe a fabric and we're just applying that into data fabrics, right? So we're building the blocks. I think a lot of people who discuss these concepts, they keep it very esoteric, they're a very high level. And what happens is that the lay person like myself doesn't then understand it and people just get scared by these concepts. So what we're doing here is we're going to go down to the essence. We're going to break this all down and then build it back up, all right? So data fabric is uh, a singular or you can say an approach for working with data with working for working let's just say with data in ways that are and we're going to write here globally consistent in ways that are globally consistent and this globally consistent is very 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 important uh, for us now what does this what could this look like for a data team uh, and i'm just going to give a very simplified approach here is if you think about the data team they have a need uh, we saw here to ingest data uh, they need to transform they need to curate uh, and and have that framework so a data team might need to say, okay, we're going to ingest data. We're going to transform data. And we're going to maybe consume that data. Okay. And if we put all of this into a box, so ingest, transform, uh, consume. And then below that, they might say, okay, all of this, we're going to have governance security, lineage, orchestration, etc. So this is a very uh, common, albeit simplified data architecture that data teams might build. And the, the, the key thing about this is if you have, uh, if you're an architect and you're working in a company and you ask for your reference architecture or the reference pattern, they might give you something like this, right? And what that, what would do, let's actually add a couple of things here. Let's add the ingestion. So here we might have uh, sales data coming in. We might have finance data coming in. We might also have maybe research and development, right? R&D coming in. So any data set that you want, there is a consistent way to ingest. There is a consistent way to transform. There is a consistent way to consume. Uh, and there is a consistent way to do governance and lineage and security orchestration and all of that. That's the essence of a data fabric. And this, these prescriptions, these prescriptions that we have are globally consistent for the organization. So if a marketing team is going to bring data into the system, so let's say, hey, marketing needs to bring their own data, a new data set. Well, they have a consistent way to ingest a set of tools. It could be Talent, Informatica, Abinitio, Fivetran, you name it. You pick one and it's consistent. A way to transform that data is going to be consistent. You're bringing that into one location. You're using a consistent way, maybe SQL or Python, and you're transforming that data. And you cons you're consuming that data. Here, let's add a couple of consumptions here. This could be, you might be using Tableau reports. You might be looking at Power BI. You might be working with ThoughtSpot uh, for your report. 
if I can spell that spot. And then you might also be uh, building applications on top of this, again, in a consistent way. And what the data fabric seeks to do is to say, hey, everything in our ecosystem within our organization is consistent. And the, the key, again, I have to really emphasize this and double emphasize this, is this idea of globally consistent within that organization. If you come in with your own data set and let's say a new team has been spun up, that team is focused on uh, designs or they're focused on uh, transportation or, or logistics, right? And they have a data set, which is the logistics data, and they want to do something with it and analyze the supply chain and all the efficiencies there. That team doesn't have the luxury of going out and finding what works for them to, uh, to use for their use case, for their problems. So the, what the logistics team would have to do is figure out how to play with this idea of globally consistent uh, requirements that the data fabric prescribes for that organization. All right, let me cancel this so the screen is a little bit cleaner. All right, so data fabrics makes things globally uh, consistent. Now, you might say, I, I already see challenges with this, right? Because like with everything in life, there are definitely pros and cons, and it all comes down to trade-offs. It all comes down into what your organization or what you as an architect uh, would be comfortable with and, and what you what benefits you versus what is, is too much of a trade-off. So what are some of the pros? Let's just look at very, very high level, uh, some of the pros that we're going to see here. And I'm sure we can name a couple of them, right? If something is consistent, we always we, we tend to like things that are consistent. If if somebody is has a consistent behavior and they always do something in one way, I think a lot of people appreciate that, right? People might not like interacting with other folks that are, are, are nice one day and the next day they're not nice. Or they show up one day for a meeting and the next day they don't show up for a meeting. Or they, they behave one way in a business transaction and then somewhere else they behave differently. So people like consistency. And if if uh, development teams have a consistent way to ingest, it makes, uh, as you can imagine, it makes things go, uh, uh, in some sense, it goes faster, but I'm not going to write that down. I think uh, I'm, I'm hesitating to write that down here for a reason. It makes things potentially go faster because it's consistent. We've decided that this is a tool. And if you want to do ingest, just use this tool and you can go faster. But I, I'm going to rebut to that point here shortly. The next piece of, of, of this approach of a data fabric, now that we understand what the data fabric is, is because it's consistent, people can, can reuse things. You can reuse artifacts. You can reuse the work that other people have done. So if, they find, if the sales team has a way of ingesting data, they've learned how to ingest data, they've figured out how to ingest data, they've built pipelines for that using a consistent tool, well, finance doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. They just go, they, they say, oh, sales teachers, knowledge share, tribal knowledge. Tell us how you, di you did this. And the finance team can have the same framework, the same patterns to follow. So you can have these consistent patterns that folks can use. Again, going back into what I talked about of accelerating or speeding up uh, uh, development time in, in some sense to a certain extent. So being able to reuse those artifacts is a big, 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 big plus. And folks might argue in some circles that it reduces, it reduces complexity. It reduces complexity because of a simplified approach. Fewer tools, uh, simple ways to do things. Um, maybe there's just one tool to ingest and everybody just uses that tool. And it's simple and you just use the tool. There are not five tools you have to manage. There is one. All right. So uh, this idea of a data fabric and the globally consistent approach makes things uh, simple. So if I am a CIO, I'm a CTO of the organization, and I'm, I'm trying to understand what my team is doing, they, I know they use one tool, one contract to negotiate with the vendor. I can train and enable my employees um, uh, on that tool. And there's just a lot of benefits that comes, uh, comes with that. Now, you can, you can imagine, and I'm just going to put a few cons here really quick. Uh, and as we're looking at this, I'm sure you can, by intuition, come up with those with those cons very, very quickly, right? Number one is just lack of agility, right? And this is a big problem. This is, a, I would say, the biggest problem that uh, that is uh, a, a challenge with Data Fabric, right? Lack of agility. If everybody has to use one ETL tool 
and everybody has to transform data in one way and everybody has to consume data in one way. Sure, that looks uh, sounds like a very good idea, but it's not very innovative, right? We know tools don't have a monopoly on innovation. There are many tools and many patterns and many uh, uh, things are out there in the market for a reason. They are out there for a reason. It's because finance might be better off with a different way or tool for ingestion and working with their data compared to sales, compared to, say, transportation and logistics, or compared to the R&D team that might be working with more cutting-edge technologies and tools. But if you have to pigeonhole your entire infrastructure or your entire team into a single data fabric because everyone has to use a consistent tool, you, you, lack, in, you lack the agility, uh, you lack innovation, uh, lack of innovation, let's actually add that, lack innovation, right? And there was just a, a, a lot of drawbacks to this. Uh, for many executives, for many uh, decision makers I interact with, uh, talk with, the fact that they want innovation. They, there's a mandate, you innovate or you die or you go out of business. And so being in a situation where your team doesn't have a flexibility to innovate or be agile to change and to respond to market pressures or a, a different competitive landscape or to regulatory demands, that is not acceptable. It's not an acceptable acceptable uh, architecture. So uh, companies uh, and teams and executives would not like that. So here we have data fabric and what we've seen is the pros and the cons. All right, there's something we still need to talk about. We need to talk about a data mesh. How does this relate to it? Now, I'm sure as you can see, um, uh, as we're going through this, that these concepts, let's, let's zoom in here. Let's take a, make sure we take a bigger pen and let's zoom in. So now we're gonna talk about data mesh. We've seen data uh, fabric, globally consistent. Uh, there are lots of pros, uh, there are lots of, of cons. Now we're going to define what a data mesh is and the problem it solves along with its own pros and its own cons. So what is a data mesh? A data mesh is, uh, it, um, or let me, let me actually get this definition right. So the data mesh solves, let's go back, a data mesh solves the problem of a data fabric, and we're going to talk about what that problem is, of a data fabric with principles except the idea of globally consistent. All right. So in other words, what I've just written here, if I was going to put it a different way is just say uh, a data mesh is a data fabric, except it's not globally consistent. All right. And so what does that mean? Um, another way I'll put this, and I'm going to use a different color uh, for this would be if we were to come this way and we were to draw circles, I like this idea of unions and sets. And here we have uh, 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 a circle, a data fabric would be a subset of that circle. So you're going to have your data fabric and outside of that would be your data mesh. All right. So inside, so a data fabric would be a subset of a data mesh. Now I know folks will want to jump up and argue with this. But just bear with me, we're going to build up to this as we go through, all right? So at the, at the fundamental level, a data fabric is just a subset of a data mesh. So let's let's look at what that is and this whole idea, this problem of, of global consistency. And I highlighted at the beginning that the, pay attention to this concept, this idea of globally consistent, because it's, it's the essence of what we're going to talk about here, pun intended with that. All right, so we look at a fabric at the beginning. Let's just go back to borrowing the idea of a fabric that we saw at the very beginning. So a fabric might look something like this. Let's take a piece of cloth fabric. And we saw that we might, if you look at the clothes you're wearing, you might have a cloth made up of a fabric that looks like this. But if you go into your closet and take a look at the different piece of cloth that you have, 
you might be surprised that you have a cloth somewhere else in your closet with a fabric that doesn't look like like what we have here on the left but it looks maybe uh something different it looks like this right it, it it's own pattern is a little bit different but it's still a fabric it's still the essence of the, your cloth and i bet you if you keep looking even if you don't have a lot of clothes and you ask your friends they might have their own you might see something even more exotic where the fabric is is different and this is me just trying to come up with a with a different fabric here right and this cloth this own fabric is a little different so we cannot deny that this is a fabric this is a fabric this is a fabric now there could be arguments of which is the best fabric which is a better fabric which one do you like which one is more uh is more effective we can have that argument all day but the the agreement that we all agree is that these are all fabrics now what has changed what has changed from the conversation that we had before what has changed the only change is the scope the only change now is the scope, is the scope of this. This fabric is this pattern in its scope. Now, you have another fabric with this pattern in this scope, and you have another fabric as a pattern in this scope, all right? So if we assume that you can only have one fabric that exists in everywhere in universe and space-time, that is what a data fabric will tell you. But with this whole idea of a data mesh, with, with the data mesh, the scope of what the fabric is allowed to do changes. And now that scope has shrunk. There is still, there's still consistency, but we don't have global consistency. What we now have is local. Let, let me not cancel that. Uh, let's, let's put local consistency. All right, so uh, a, a data a mesh still borrows from the principles of a data fabric, except for the fact that uh, consistency is local. So here we have something that is consistent in this space. Here we have something consistent in this space. Here we have something consistent in this space. And what the data mesh adds on top of this now is to say, hey, there is a local consistency, but there has to be something meta above all of this. This still all needs to be stitched together. And this is where interruptibility becomes key. This is where interruptibility comes into play. Now, we have a fabric there. We have a fabric there. This fabric should be able to talk to that fabric. This fabric can talk to that fabric. This fabric can talk to that, to that fabric. All right? And they can all talk to each other. And this is where uh, interruptibility really comes into play interruptibility really comes into play so now we've talked about fabrics here in general let's just add data to it because i think adding data to it it's the, the discussion is still very consistent so with data fabric if we just throw data into this so this is my data fabric here this is my data fabric here this is my data fabric here all locally consistent now this might be uh the sales team uh this might be finance team this might be the 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 R and D organization, and they have their own uh, locally consistent data fabric. This team has their own locally consistent data fabric, and sales has their own locally consistent data fabric. Within this sales data fabric, there are laws, there are rules, there are, there are things that are, that are locally consistent uh, inside of that fabric. As far as they're concerned, the laws and the way they do things are consistent. So if we, if we go back into how they ingest data, how they transform data, how they consume data, how they govern data, how they sec do security. That fabric is still true, except it's locally consistent inside of the sales fabric. Now, if we were to switch over to R&D, they are going to have their own fabric of ingestion, con uh, consumption, curation, governance, lineage, all of that, but it's going to be locally consistent to them, right? Same thing for finance, same thing for the finance team. They have their own fabric and it's locally consistent for them. All right. But the key of what we want here is the idea that uh, because let me let me break the, let me let me step back here. If we have 
uh, fabrics that are all locally consistent, but they can't talk to each other. What we just have is silos and just things that just exist. But organizations are cohesive or, uh, entities. Sales and marketing have to talk. Finance and, and R&D have to talk. Uh, public relations and, and transportation, they all have to talk. So interoperability now becomes key to allow for these different data fabrics to talk to each other. And that's one key concept of a data mesh. A data mesh allows for the robustness and the consistency provided by a data fabric with the additional bonus of decentralization, federation, uh, and still have a cohesive structure that can bring all of that together by interruptibility. So uh, here, sales team could decide to say, okay, we're going to use uh, Talent as a tool, we're going to do SQL, and we're going to put our data on Snowflake, right? And that team, that's what is locally consistent for that team. That's their data fabric. That's their truth. That's their ground truth. That's what they do. Now, you go over to finance, they might say, all right, this SQL thing is kind of interesting, but we work with a lot of files. We want to do Python because we do a lot of machine learning and forecasting, and we're going to do our visualization with K9, all right? And the team is might make that selection, and they have the flexibility to do that. R&D might say, hey, for our own team, uh, our needs are different. We do a lot of research. Our people are a lot of pro uh, programmers. We're going to do a lot of Java. Uh, maybe do Snowflake with Snowpack, and we're going to do Power BI uh, for reporting. So we're going to use Power BI for reporting. Again, that's that's their truth. That's their groundwork. That's their data fabric. That Those laws are locally consistent for them, but not necessarily globally consistent. And I'm sure we can always uh, 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 look at this, and people who have been in this space for a while, we'll look at this and say, but through this is not a new concept. What you're talking about uh, is something that people have solved a long time, well, not a long time ago, but uh, this idea is not new. And I just want to call it out. This is not a new idea. This whole idea of data mesh or, of, or federation or local consistency versus global consistency is something that the data engineering world, actually the software engineering world has, has done this already. All right, so this is nothing new. If you've ever heard about uh, microservices or the microservices architecture, uh, this is exactly it, except applied to data, all right? So uh, in this in this context, data mesh and 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 microservices are, are essentially the same thing. And what is true about it is, let me reduce the spend size. What is true about this is the key characteristics is. Uh, we talked about ground truth. We talked about this whole idea of ground truth. And we also talked about this whole idea of, so this is ground truth, and then there are meta truth, truths, right? So the ground truth can be how we ingest data, how we curate, how we uh, report on data, etc. The, the, the specifics of each of the specifics inside of each of these data fabrics. Now, the meta truth, um, and this is a new one we're introducing here, is how, how to interrupt. Interrupt it. So, interruptibility. Interrupt and share or collaborate. Collaborate. All right. So if you have a ground truth for the different decentralized data fabrics or data side or, or data teams, and you have a ground truth for that, if there is no meta uh, consistent way to interrupt and to share, to connect and to have them to talk, you, you're not going to have an, an architecture. You, what you just, yeah, an architecture will not exist. Uh, just like if you have uh, pieces of fabric, just let's go back to the analogy of clothes because I really like that. If you have two pieces of fabric that just stay by each other, for you to have a, a to build to having a cloth that you can wear on your body or a dress or whatever, you need to do some sewing. You need to stitch things together. And if you don't have a way of stitching the different fabrics you have, you're not gonna have a a, a dress or a cloth or something. All right. So this whole idea of stitching, this whole idea of bringing things together. 
is a key is 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 very key in in allowing for a data mesh to exist in allowing for these different data fabrics to mesh and if you see my fingers i'm kind of moving my fingers around uh to describe the whole idea of mesh and coming together and smooshing and doing all of that right and, uh, this interruptibility allows for that and and there are many ways to do interruptibility you might have uh, apis uh you might have data sharing uh you might have file transfer whatever it is it just has to be we agree in in the meta way a meta is above if, it, if you have something a, a meta is something about that thing right so uh here a, a meta truth about uh different data fabrics is that there is a consistent way to interrupt uh without that you can't really have a mesh, all right? So um, this meta truth is something that, again, the data, the software engineering world has solved that with microservices and APIs and REST and all of that will, be, will basically bring in those concepts into the data engineering world, right? So data engineering is borrowing a lot of concepts uh, from software engineering. These microservices translating to, uh, translating to data mesh is one, uh, the whole idea of uh, DevOps, translating into uh, data architect uh, architectures as uh, data ops is another one. So there is a lot of things that if you pay attention to how the software engineering uh, uh, patterns are evolving, you're going to see a lot of that carrying over into data engineering uh, as well. All right. So what are some of the, 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 the key characteristics uh, here? Uh, I'm going to talk about the key characteristics here, pros and cons of this data mesh now that we've seen and hopefully understand what the data mesh is as compared to uh as compared to uh, a data fabric because a lot i've seen too many too many even smart architects that have been in this space for a long time they describe this in 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 ways that either are not comprehensible or that might be misleading to to folks right? and these terms just get really confusing so for once we understand a data fabric is the essence a fabric is the essence and if you have those fabrics and you stitch them together, and you stitch the different fabrics together. So, uh, uh, so this could be data fabric two, and you stitch those different fabrics together. You end up with a data mesh. And how you stitch, and how you interrupt, and how you bring those all together is is very key. Those are the meta truths. That's interruptibility. That is data sharing, APIs, whatever it is, um, and uh that allows you to build a data mesh so let's go in and talk about the pros and cons and then i'm gonna come back and and tee up and and touch one concept that i'm pushing to the end that you don't want to miss and i i think that that'll be a very important concept but let's just go in and talk about the pros and the cons here if i can get my screen to behave so here let's get this paint uh let's talk about pros what are some of the pros uh with a data mesh all right as you can imagine, we saw some challenges with data fabric, and the, the challenge, one of the big challenges was lack of agility. All right, so as you can imagine, uh, a data mesh is very agile, allows for agility. It allows for Darwinian. I'm gonna write Darwinian, uh, Darwinian style innovation. So lots of benefits here. You can you can see. Uh, so my argue that is faster, and I'm gonna write faster here. Remember, I'm writing faster here, but for data fabric, I did not write faster. And then also in, there is federation. There is that federation, and you know for the people in politics would would. And there is debate on this, but I'm sure some people in politics would believe this concept of federation is is one one of the best political uh, way, ways of structuring things. And there are reasons for that. So let's talk about agility, right? It allows for agility. Why? Because sales team can they, they can decide their tools, they can decide their frameworks, they can decide their approaches to use, and they are not bogged down by a central uh, dictate telling them you have to use this, you have to fit into this. So they are more agile. They can if the market changes for sales, but it doesn't need finance to change or it doesn't need R and D to change. The sales can change. They can do what they need to do, and they can innovate in that space without breaking everything else. Right. So there's agility flexibility the organization can again if you're seeing my hands it, it can twist and turn it can shrink and, and expand 
uh, with ups and flows based on the pressures that the, the team is seeing. And different teams are trying out and experimenting with different tools, which all leads into innovation. So sales might try out uh, or finance might try out K9 and realize that, oh, this is really great. We're doing a lot of exciting things with this. Maybe uh, the R&D team should try it out too, right? And so if you have all these different pockets of innovations happening, there is that there is that idea with the Darwinian style that an evolution that you're going to come up to the best optimal uh, truth. So if you have a lot of locally uh, consistent ways or locally in, in math, let me step back in mathematics, there's the idea of local minimum or uh, versus global minimum and all of that, right? If you have a bunch of local minimums that are all competing with each other, you're going to eventually get to a global a global um, a minimum, a global consistency. So uh, if if there are things that just works and sales figures are out, this is like having different organizations doing R&D for you, doing research and, and doing tests to figure out what's the best. And if they share knowledge and interrupt with each other, your organization will be more innovative than the organization that just, uh, let me write that down here, that does uh, uh, technology edicts. So no tech edicts, right? There are no technology edicts. There's no uh, ivory tower architect telling you this is what you have to use. They don't do that, right? The only edict, the only agreement that folks would, would have, and this, this will go into the cons here, would be, agreeing on this meta truth as long as you've agreed on the meta truth as long as you've agreed on the meta edict of, of how we are gonna uh, uh, cooperate in here how we're gonna talk to each other once you agree on that uh the rest then becomes decentralized the rest now becomes local conversations the rest becomes federated the rest are all happening within the local fabrics there there is no such thing as a global fabric is you have your own fabric it's local you decide you make your decisions you innovate and uh, you rely on that global that global approach or the global agreement to, to 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 share and to collaborate to then talk and share data. All right. So these are the pros. I'm sure you can start seeing the cons that are coming up here already. And one of them, and this might encapsulate almost it all, would be hard to manage. Right. These are things that. Uh, a concept like this, decentralization, federation, and all of that, they all sound good in, in theory, right? They all sound really good in theory. But but how you manage and ensure this interruptibility and the consistency uh, to make sure that this, this, this team is talking to this team uh, in a timely manner and there are no dependencies that break things could get really challenging to manage. All right? It can get really challenging to manage because no one is... is uh, it's It's... Is managing it all, uh, all. No one is there managing all of it. So that could be a, a really, really uh, big uh, con uh, for this. So that could be a really, really big con for this. Um, and because it's hard to manage, now ev all the dominoes might fall, right? If it's hard to manage, people might not innovate. If people don't innovate, it's not agile. And so you, you go into a lot of cons just because of that. But if you have the right uh, primitives and you have the right governance, uh, federated governance in place and really, really being strong on how this interruptibility is executed, uh, then you know that even if one of your uh, data fabrics or your data teams and uh, falls, then the other ones, your entire system doesn't break, right? So that's just something to, to, to think about. And then also making sure that as you chain all of these things together, as you chain all of these different fabrics together, that you don't chain it in a way, let's, uh, let's look at some chains, that you don't chain it in a way where there is a weak link, right? So if you're building these different data fabrics and we're chaining them together, and this one depends on this one, and this depends on this one, and this depends on this one, this depends on this one. Well, what if this fails? right well now you're only strong as the weakest link in your chain so that could be a problem if you have an api that's getting from this api that gets on this api that gets on this api and this guy has no control over what this guy is doing and and they this team decides to make the wrong decision or they, they, they choose a the wrong tool and everything is breaking now you got dependencies that are gonna bottleneck because of this right so uh even though data mesh in theory sounds great there still has to be this overarching this meta this meta, you have to be maniacal about this. You have to really make sure that 
your enterprise architects or your global architects uh, are, are thinking about this and are really putting some thought into this, right? This is not just uh, the Darwinian soup of everybody just doing their own thing and then you hope and pray that it works, right? You still have to be to be careful and making sure that even if you have uh, different uh, uh, different uh, individual data fabrics, that those data fabrics talk in a way where if one breaks here, if there is a weak link here and this goes offline, you still have your 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 infrastructure uh, uh, stable and resilient and 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 very. Um, I like Nassim Taleb that talks about uh, things that are uh, things that don't break. So things that are anti fragile, uh, anti fragile. Can't even talk anymore. Uh, anti fragile, right? So Nassim Taleb uh, is a, an American author talks a lot about that. He's written some books. So you want to build anti fragile uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's a concept that I've been liking a lot uh, lately. So. We talked on talked about a lot of things. Now I want to uh, address w one question before I uh, uh, before we we start wrapping this up. So the question would be: uh, let, Let's use this in red. If I can get this to a bigger pen, that would be great. Let's uh, use this. So our question now is: uh, Can uh, data mesh? Can a data mesh? Uh, exists without uh, data fabric? That's the question. All right. So seeing all of this, where we've looked at the data fabric as being the essence, consistent, it has to be consistent. A data mesh is a way to glue together, to stitch together different data fabrics uh, with meta truths. Now, if we ask, can a data mesh exist without a data fabric? And the reason we're asking this question is, you might be an architect, an executive, and you're wondering which, which, which pattern are we using? Which pattern should we think about? Can, can, you re can it really exist that there is a data mesh or you go with data mesh and not a data fabric? And I'm sure by now, hopefully we can clearly, and I appreciate it, <laughs> that would mean a lot to me if everybody now at this point can say that the answer to that is a no. Right, you cannot have a data mesh without a data fabric. It's just like asking, can you have uh, matter without space? Without space, right? This is, and maybe I don't know physics enough to appreciate the details of this. But if you have matter, you you need a space for that matter to exist. That's at least my what my intuition tells me. So it's just like going here saying uh, a data mesh is made up of a data fabric. The data fabric is the essence, is the ground truth, is the is the fundamental piece of it. How we ingest data, how we transform data, that is all described in the data fabric. Now, the only thing we've changed is the scope of a data fabric. A data fabric is not globally consistent. You don't have just one global data fabric. There's not, there's not one global data fabric, right? What we have is... Uh, uh, individual data fabrics that all can coexist in the ecosystem and they all have their own patterns, right? We have individual data fabrics and the, they all coexist and that glue that brings them together is the data mesh. And we're seeing the rise of the data mesh because companies want to innovate. They want to allow for these different data fabrics. They want to try different data fabrics. They want to play with different tools. They want different experiments to be carried out. They want to use best of breed technologies. And if you have something that's globally consistent, you don't get those benefits, right? So going back to this question uh, posed by uh, by somebody that I uh, on, on the channel, can data mesh exist without data fabric? And the answer to that is a very simple answer is no. Why? Because a data fabric, that essence makes up a, a data mesh. Now, the only difference we've changed here is the scope. I want to touch on some, some key characteristics here of, of data fabric that I think will be ha uh, very handy to have uh, as we wrap up the presentation. So we've talked about data fabric here, and I've used the term data fabric to describe this piece of the conversation. I've used data fabric to describe this piece of the conversation. In, in in the real world, people you might hear people using the term, not data fabric, they, at, at this point they might say, hey, this is a data uh, product, right? So the sales team is delivering a data product for us. And we don't care 
what technology the sales team uses. We don't care what ETL tool or how they do uh, transformations. I don't care. All I care is that if I need sales data, I go to the sales team, we're going to get the sales data from. And that fabric or the, the, the fabric, the data fabric produces a data product, which is then consumed by the different system. So the way these th this different uh, uh, things here talk is asking for data products, right? So data product is, is, is something to really pay attention to. You might see this in, in literature on this topic. So data product. So this might be finance data product. This might be uh, uh, what well, does R&D data product, and this will be the finance data uh, product. So they all produce uh, data products. Now, what this means for us is that for a data mesh, the focus is data as a product. Okay. We don't care about the technology. This is key. If there's any takeaway from here is understanding that this, this architecture, this design pattern focuses on, focuses on data as a product and those products become interruptible. People can request for the product and they can produce data products. So the sales team is just, they have a deliverable and what's their deliverable? It's a data product. We don't care how they, they, they come up to that product, what technologies they use, it's none of our business. But when we request for sales data, we request for their data product, they give it to us. So data now is elevated to a higher level. It's a product itself, it's, which is very different from the, 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 from the very the approach above here, which in data fabric, data is a by product and this is a key fundamental concept to really understand this right so in the world of data fabric data is a byproduct um, because we at this point the, 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 what people care about is the technology what tools are you using how are you ingesting data how are you consuming data transforming data governing data all of that right so the tools almost become the, the priority and making sure that those tools are consistent. And any data coming through within the tool is just a byproduct that flows through. All right. So if I have uh, my sales data, well, the sales data just flows through a consistent pipeline that we've defined and, and following the same consistent frameworks and all of that. And at the end, we get something which is just a byproduct. Uh, of that process. So data is a byproduct, whereas in this approach here, data is the product. So if we were to spin up a new team and we call this new team, uh, let's call this, let's say supply chain. Uh, let's, let's cancel that. Let's say a new team was coming on board and this team was supply uh, chain. All right. So supply chain will be spun up and they will be expected they would be expected to produce a data product that can be consumed by finance as an example and it doesn't matter what technology they use it doesn't matter what tools they use it doesn't matter what transformation what 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 the version control they use that's the supply chain's business in within their data fabric they can figure that out but at the end of the day they are going to produce a deliverable which is a data product so this focus here is really on data as a product. And now you have this self-organizing uh, self data teams that can be spun up around this with data engineers, quality engineers, product managers. They all come in here uh, and they work inside of this, this uh, group, this self-organizing group. And their deliverable is a data product, okay? And that data product is, should be interruptible. Uh, it could be an API, it could be a data share, like with Snowflake allowing data share across uh, different accounts and different teams. Uh, it could be that, uh, or it could be a REST API. It, it doesn't matter what you've agreed on as your means of interruptibility, but the result is this team is producing a data product. So just something to really think about and to, 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 to take home on this, on this concept that when we talk about data mesh and we talk about, let's cancel this. So when we talk about data mesh, uh, we talk about, uh, data fabric. Data fabric is focusing on data as a byproduct, 
data itself is not the most valuable thing. The technologies and the decisions that have been made for the technology products are the most valuable things. Now, is that right or wrong? You've seen the pros and cons, right? Uh, whereas Data Fabric says, hey, forget about the technology. Let's treat data as the most valuable asset, is the first class citizen. And the technology choices that you use to get all that data is up to you. But what we care about is if we need the data in this format, this way, we're going to get it. Now you go innovate, figure out the best way to do that, but give us data in this in this way. So data is the product. All right. So guys, there you have it. There you have it. One of those uh, fun lectures to make. I didn't expect that we're going to go this long, but I, I, you know, it's one of those things that you see a, a topic, you see a concept like this, uh, that on the surface is simple. And you read a blog article about it and you see that there is all this debate going back and forth. But but few people take the time to break it down and really to build it up, which is what we've hoped to do uh, in this lecture here. So hopefully this gives you some ideas on, on thinking about this data fabric, data mesh. If you're engaging in the conversation, you can stand on solid footing now and understand what it is, what is the difference, right? I, I think the industry really needs to get its act together and, and, and have a common understanding of all these this, this concepts, right? I know the consultants out there would want to confuse everybody because they have uh some engagements to sell but for the average architect practitioner in the field this are not this is nothing new this has been around uh a data fabric a data mesh we've seen uh the idea of fabric from physics fundamental truth data fabric is trying to make the fundamental truth globally consistent across your organization that's what the data fabric does uh in the way we ingest data we transform data we curate data a data mesh on the other hand says hey Let's localize that. Let's have local consistency versus global consistency to allow for innovation. And then we have uh, a way of interruptibility to stitch together the different uh, fabrics or the different data products or the different teams that are all working. And it does have its own pros and it does have its own cons. And at the end of the day, we also saw that uh, a data mesh and a data fabric really cannot exist. Uh, they're all one of the same thing. Uh, a, a fabric makes up a mesh. Uh, the essence, the fabric is the essence, the mesh is just the stitching together of different data fabrics. So we saw this idea of you, if you were to draw this into a uh, into a circle, a fabric would be inside a subset and you can have different fabrics stitched together in a way that makes up a data mesh. And so as of making this video, what's popular in the industry is this whole rise of data mesh. And the rise of that is because data meshes uh, uh, take the best of data fabrics and says, hey, why why have just one data fabrics if we have many different data fabrics or different data products uh we allow for decentralized innovation for federalization um we can then build a mesh that's consistent uh well not consistent we can build a mesh that's stitched together all of this just like the way you can take different fabrics of different colors and different shades and different textures and stitch together an amazing uh shirt or, or, or blouse or or dress uh, this applies to data is what companies and teams and organizations are very excited about. So there you have it. Hopefully you were able to watch this then and uh, uh, do appreciate the, the presentation. If you do uh, share this with somebody that might get value out of it. Um, you have been very, very awesome uh, watching to the end. If you have any questions or topics you want me to take and break down and make a big deal about, you know, take simple concepts and make a big deal about, I'm, I love doing that. So let me know in the comment section below. I'll see what I can do. Again, you have been awesome watching to the end. I have been through and I'll see you in the next lecture.